Options for direct investments into private companies. Perhaps the investment strategy with the highest return potential and the highest risk is direct investing in early stage companies. Similar to a venture capital firm, a family office with sufficient skill and resources can serve as an angel investor. The term angel refers to a wealthy individual who invests in early stage companies to which they have no direct family ties or relationships. Angels are the first strangers to invest in startup companies. Let's look at two extreme examples of angel investments. Google. When the company was just started, an angel investor invested $200,000. When the company went public, his stake was worth $320 million. That was at a stock price of $100. Google hit nearly $700 per share towards the end of 2007 and has hovered around $600 per share in 2012. He could have earned $2 billion on an investment of $200,000 depending on when he sold his shares. Instagram A VC firm, Andreessen Horowitz, invested $250,000 in Instagram very early in the company's development. Because of the size and timing of the investment, we'll group it in with the other angel investments, not traditional VC investments. Only two years later, the company was purchased by Facebook for a billion dollars. His stake was worth almost $78 million. That's a 312 times return. For every dollar the firm invested, they got $312 back only two years later. Unfortunately, for every Google and Instagram, there are thousands of stories of investors losing all of their investment. Angel investing is thus highly risky, but potentially highly rewarding. We will discuss some of these risks in a separate video, but we'll explain some of the more common methods in private and private private companies in this video. Typically, when we talk about direct investing, or angel investing in particular, we are talking about equity investments. This means buying stock, or shares, in a company. In practice, there are two classes of stock, common and preferred. Common stock is what most people think of when they think of buying or selling stocks. Why? Because we usually buy common stock of public companies on the stock exchanges. You buy X number of shares at Y price. For each share, you may get one vote at the annual shareholders meeting. Of course, for public companies on the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ, there are millions of shares outstanding, so even if you own a few thousand shares, you have limited power to influence a company. In small, private companies, angel investors may own 10-30% to 30 of the company, and thus have some influence on the company. You can also demand a board seat to further exercise some level of control over the company. The main factors to consider when purchasing common stock is the value of the company, which mathematically relates to both the stock price and your current ownership, and your ability to oversee the company's operations. Preferred stock, on the other hand, does not have voting rights, but it does have other benefits. As the name preferred implies, preferred stock has some preferences. The most common preference is called liquidation preference. When a company is liquidated, either with a closure of the business or sale of the company, preferred stockholders get paid first, before common stockholders, sometimes at a premium. So even if the company is not sold at a huge multiple, preferred stock owners may get one and a half or two times their money back, and common stockholders may get almost nothing. Another preference often used is any variety of anti-dilution protection that helps early investors maintain their relative stake in the company over subsequent financing rounds. With preferred stock, you can negotiate both the initial price and the preferences. Because of these preferences, preferred stock is more complicated than common stock, which means the legal fees for setting up a preferred round are greater than for a relatively simple common round. Again, common stock and preferred stock are both forms of equity. Each form has some advantages and disadvantages. But buying equity is not the only way to provide capital into a private company. After all, why should there be? Think about all the ways you can buy a car. You can pay cash, finance it, lease it. You can buy new or buy used, pre-owned, encore, antique. Likewise, there are a number of ways to quote unquote invest in private companies. Another common approach is to provide debt or a loan to the company. 
Keep in mind, if a company is coming to you for debt, it probably means that they could not secure a loan from a bank. This should first alert you that there may be a risk in the company and signal that you should be looking for a higher interest rate than banks charge. With that note, what are the advantages of debt over equity? First, it can be a lot simpler to create a loan document or promissory note than a full-fledged private securities offering. In this case, simpler directly equates to cheaper when legal fees are considered. Even ignoring cost, owning equity can be an all-or-nothing opportunity. If the company fails, shareholders can be left with nothing. On the other hand, with the payment of interest payments associated with debt, you will at least get some of your investment back, even if the company later defaults or crumbles entirely. If you also receive your principal back at some point, you are guaranteed a return on the investment. That return equals the interest payment. Further, in the event of bankruptcy, debt is paid before equity. You stand a better chance of getting repaid at least part of the principal than equity holders stand to get paid their investment. You can require a personal guarantee from the founder, which further protects your loan. If the company is unable to pay back the loan, the founder must use their own personal assets to cover the outstanding liabilities. What about the disadvantages of debt? Despite the measures just described, in the worst case scenario, the company may completely run out of cash and thus have no money to pay for interest payments, let alone repay the principal. Further, many founders either start off with little assets or diminish their personal holdings to fund the company. If there are no assets, you have little recourse to recoup your loan. So just like equity investors, you can lose your entire investment in a failed company. On the flip side, in the best case scenario, when the company is wildly successful, debt's biggest shortcoming is exposed. Remember the Google and Instagram examples? Imagine those early investors provided loans to the company instead of purchasing equity. Yes, they would have been paid back, but only at the agreed-upon interest rates. The $200,000 invested in Google at an annual interest rate of 25% would have generated $250,000 in interest over five years, which is more than double the initial investment. Not bad. But this pales in comparison to the billions of dollars or more the investor earned. In other words, the best you can do as an investor by providing debt is capped by the interest rate. Is there a way to enjoy some of the safety of debt, but also some of the upside potential of equity? Yes, convertible debt is a combination of debt and equity. Essentially, a convertible debt is a loan that can convert to equity in the future. Instead of paying back the principal, the debt converts to an equivalent value of equity, with a sweetener on top. For example, if you invest $100,000 into a convertible note, you may receive interest for a few years, then convert to $100,000 in equity, plus, say, a 20% bonus, giving you $120,000 worth of stock. Another common approach is to have the principal convert at a discount off of a future stock price. If the stock later sells at $1 per share, instead of receiving 100,000 shares for your $100,000, you can convert at 20% off of the $1 price, or at 80 cents, and thus receive 125,000 shares. At a current price of $1 per share, your stock would immediately be worth $125,000. It almost works like a stock option in that you can buy shares at a lower price than currently available and thus see an immediate gain in value. There are several ad advantages to convertible debt. First, it begins as debt, so you can receive interest payments. Second, it converts to equity, usually when a predetermined event happens. This trigger, as it is called, is oftentimes a subsequent investment round. Once you own equity, you could benefit from rapid and steep increases in value, perhaps along the lines of Google or Instagram. It allows you and the entrepreneur to avoid negotiations over the company's value. It is very hard to determine the valuation of an early-stage company, so convertible debt effectively tables this discussion until later. It is like checking in poker. If you don't know what to bet, wait and see what everyone says before you put a value on your hand. For less sophisticated investors, 
punting the negotiations to later investors, who presumably are more experienced and knowledgeable. The convertible notes can save you from being crammed down. What does that mean? Let's say you are very excited about an entrepreneur and his company. So is he, naturally. He convinces you this is going to be the next big thing. So the company is worth $5 million now. You have little reason to object, and so you make the deal. However, a year or two later, the company needs to raise a few million more, and the entrepreneur meets with seasoned venture capital firms. The problem is, they all agree the company is worth only $2 million. That's after you invested thinking it was worth $5 million two years ago. If the company needs the capital and has to accept terms at a $2 million valuation, you would lose 60% of your investment. Your investment is now crammed down from $5 million to $2 million. So, using a convertible note prevents this and still gives you a fixed bump in value, regardless of the value subsequent investors place in the company. During the volatile years last decade, convertible notes became more popular. However, they are not without issues. You should consider a few disadvantages of convertible debt. The biggest disadvantage of convertible debt is that it still potentially limits your reward for taking higher risk. Pure debt caps your return at the interest rate, but convertible debt also has a built-in limit. Consider this. If you make a $100,000 equity investment in an early-stage company valued at $1 million, and that company makes great strides over the following 12 months, it may then be valued at $2 million. If you had equity, your share would have doubled in value. You would now have $200,000, at least on paper. However, if you had a convertible note, as described earlier, your share would only be worth $120,000, or $125,000. Choosing a convertible note instead of a straight equity investment costs you $75,000 to $80,000. Another disadvantage is it really just shifts the focus of negotiations off the share price onto the interest rate and discount rate. So, you still have to do the analysis and discussions about future value of your investment. Thirdly, as a debtor, you may not have the voting rights or the board seat available to equity investors, although you can negotiate for these. There are a number of variations of equity investments and debt instruments, including common stock or preferred stock equity investments, debt, or convertible debt. There are also a wide variety of terms you can negotiate for each to maximize your return or to minimize your risk. Ultimately, the optimal approach you take depends on your client's goals, their overall portfolio, and the specific opportunity with the company.